Our uh, next speaker is a, a really um, profound person is uh, uh, Dr. Steve Benner. Steve Benner uh, basically invented the field of synthetic biology. His team was the first to uh, synthesize a gene that could create an enzyme. Uh, he has invented uh, diagnostic tests for a multitude of diseases, uh, AIDS, various types of hepatitis. In fact, he was one of the first people to uh, invent a rapid uh, test for uh, COVID, which unfortunately the FDA delayed forever in approving and caused thousands of deaths that way. But in any case, um, his thoughts are, you know, on, on the nature of life are, are profound because he's been looking at how to make it. Um, because if you can make it, you can understand it. And if you can't, you don't. Anyway, here's Steve Benner. Well, thanks very much, Robert. And I'm assuming you are seeing only my slideshow and not the little side clip that shows all the nice pictures of all the other people who spoke here. Um, we've given you know, somewhat of a provocative title, How SpaceX Could Find Life on Mars as it prepares for planned missions. This is actually being given with my colleague, Jan Spacek, who actually is here in the United States on a coronavirus visa, as Robert has pointed out in my day job, we actually do useful stuff like testing for viruses. But the points for today are more fun than that. And I wanna just convey the fact that first, over the past two decades, data from synthetic biology, which Robert has just mentioned, but also the geological history of Earth and Mars from NASA explorations, as well as studies in prebiotic chemistry, have given us really increased confidence that life originated on Mars. There are borate and other minerals needed to do that, we think, that if it did originate, we think it likely survived to the present day. And this is the Jurassic Park, Jeff Goldblum dictum that life uh, finds a way. And third, um, we have presented from these two things, universal and detectable molecular signs of life's present. And we now know, I think, we, at least we have with increasing confidence, the view that we know how to look for those signs and where to look for them. Now, I, I'm delighted to always share a, a, a panel with Carol Stoker, because as she has said, as exactly my sentiment, she has, she works for NASA, I don't. So I have the ability to say it just a little bit less politely than she does. As Chris pointed out, I'm a hundred years old, if you round, um, and I'm convinced at this point that NASA may never, that means in my lifetime, look for life on Mars. And so for that, if Martian life is to be found again in my lifetime, uh, a private organization must look for it, which is hence the measure mention of, of, of SpaceX. So let's just see what I can do here. Um, um, so what we're gonna do here is uh, give you the conclusions of this talk first, because it makes it easier for the talk to be followed. And the first point that we make is that synthetic biology defines what alien DNA looks like. And the way it does that is because synthetic biologists go into the laboratory, they make all sorts of alternative forms of DNA. We find out what works and we find out what doesn't work. And that way we can define the universe of possible informational molecules. And there's that word information, which Paul Davies just mentioned to you, right? Biology is very much connected to information and informational molecules are very much important for that. You have to actually make the word flesh. You actually have to make a molecule that holds the information. The information alone can't exist in a vacuum. The second thing I, I have to persuade you, and this is a conclusion again, is that alien DNA must have a repeating backbone charge. Negative charge or positive charge in your DNA, the backbone charge is negative. It's carried by the phosphates, for those of you who are familiar with the chemistry of DNA. In a coronavirus RNA, the backbone charge is also repeating negative, but repeating positive charge backbones are also positive. But the point is that for an informational molecule to work, it must have a repeating backbone charge. And we like to say in the business, it must look like a poly electrolyte. That is a repeating charge. Great. So it turns out that's useful because highly charged molecules are easily isolated from water, even when they're present in very, very high dilution, very low concentrations. And that's because they move in electric fields. Positive charges 
make a molecule move towards a negative charged electrode. Negative charged molecules, of course, move towards a positively charged electrode, and they can be captured on charged surfaces. And that's going to be an important point to try to get alien DNA, that is, in this case, Martian DNA, with a repeating backbone charge, positive or negative, we don't know which, out of a large amount of water, even if it's present there only in very small amounts. Okay, the, there's something called an agnostic life finder, uh, an ALF, which if you agree that these are universal statements of life, uh, that is, if you're the universal statements for an informational molecule that's necessary to support Darwinian evolution, which theory says is the only way in which matter can self-organize to give properties that we value in life, then we can build an agnostic life finder that will exploit the facts that I've just mentioned in points one, uh, <clears throat> two, and three. So that's cool. Um, now, NASA, again, I'm, I've, I mean, as the older I get, as you know, there's just as much time between Charles Lindbergh's flight and the Viking 1976 mission as there is between the night 1976 mission and, and me today. So that's a long time, as Carol mentioned. So, but even if NASA is slow, and uh, we heard the NASA administrator this morning say uh, the African proverb, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go long, go with other people. Well, when you're only going to live uh, four score and 10 years or whatever, I'm going to live, you, you're not so interested in anything but going uh, fast because that means you're, if you don't go fast, you're not going to go. But SpaceX will go. And when it goes, at least according to Elon Musk, it will mine volumes of water to make fuel for the return trip. And in that volumes of water, um, ALF could be an expensive add-on to SpaceX's in-situ research utilization mining of water to make that fuel. And of course, as you've already heard from Carol this morning and also from talks yesterday and, and the day before, water is likely to be abundant on Mars. And I'll give you in a moment some of the reasons why we think it should hold Martian life. So let me just give you a little bit of background. So synthetic biology tells you how to look for Martian life and by um, searching the universe of structures for alien DNA. So to illustrate, I'm gonna show you what your DNA looks like, sort of. There's a cartoon form on the left. If you're interested in the molecular form on the right, I'm going to use the cartoon form here. Synthetic biologists change the structure of DNA in the lab to learn what different kinds of structures are possible as informational molecules. So some changes you can make and the molecule still behaves for information purposes and some changes you can't make and you learn from that. So these are asking what if or why not questions. So for example, your DNA carries information as Paul mentioned by building units that follow two rules of complementarity. First, they had to be size complementary. That is, that small things have to pair with large things. And there you have the two Lego bricks, small and large. And that means that the overall combination of two, the base pair, all has the same size, more or less, whether it's GC or AT or TA or CG. And the second thing is that hydrogen bonds must be complementary between those two bases. So the hydrogen bonds are represented by blue prongs and red holes. And in the Lego model, they fit together. So if you want to ask what if or why not questions, you might say, well, why not other patterns of prongs and holes? Aha, that's a what if or a why not question and synthesis can answer this because we can actually make DNA with 12 letters. We actually know that it's possible. We know this because we've synthesized it in the laboratory and it performs the service of storing information. In fact, it forms structures. We know this because we made those structures in the lab and use them in these diagnostics products that are now somewhere around the neighborhood of $1.4 billion. Um, this stores information better than four-letter DNA, which means if you're a Ferengi that you have more profit. And uh, um, expanded DNA, however, has also the ability to evolve, which is the archetypal feature of of uh, an information or a biomolecule. And this just shows you a scheme. I won't go into the details. Here we are making libraries of alien DNA. We're presenting them to cancer cells. Some of the alien DNA binds, some of it doesn't. Uh, we throw away the stuff that doesn't bind or we recover the stuff that does bind. And then we further mutate that alien DNA to get these evolved fluorescent alien DNA molecules that here bind and paint breast cancer cells and deliver drugs. And so that's more, more profit to support astrobiology research here for fun. 
So we can change the informational storage units at the very fundamental level. And this caused, caused a level of despair among those who seek alien life, because if you can change this, then you can change anything. And if you can change anything, we cannot possibly know what to look for when we go look for life on Mars. And so Carol Cleland, who is shown on the slide, cites our work to show how difficult it will be to construct a universal theory of life. And indeed, synthetic biology does show how different biochemistry might be. But, and this is an important point, Synthetic biologists have also found features that are invariant in DNA, structures that must be present in any informational molecule that is capable of supporting evolution. And that's, of course, what we're going to look for, right? All you assume is that you assume only that Darwinian evolution is the only mechanism that allows matter to autonomously assemble to give features that we value in biology, no matter what, where in the galaxy this life is. Um, and that's going to be um, something that is going to focus, that will tell us what we cannot change. And here are two things that we have learned through synthetic biology that we cannot change. One is that the informational units must all have the same size and shape. And that's why there's size complementarity on the base pair, because the base pair must all have more or less the same size and shape, even if you change the the ability to bind. And second, a backbone supporting these DNA must have a repeating charge. And I want to, those are two such important points for an alien or agnostics life finder that I want to emphasize them because we actually know these as an experimentally validated statement, but they also have strong theoretical support. There is Erwin Schrodinger, who Paul Davies mentioned to you, he's actually the same Schrodinger of the Schrodinger equation, but by 1943, he was slumming and doing biochemistry. Now he knew nothing about the structure of DNA in 1943, but he knew that simple binding cannot guarantee faithful information transfer, at least at the scale that it is needed for life. For that, Schrodinger needed what he called the physics of phase transition. And for that, exchangeable informational building blocks must have all the same size and shape. They must all fit into what he called an aperiodic crystal structure. And that's kind of useful. So that means that Martian DNA may have four building blocks or six building blocks or eight, but to support evolution, they must all have more or less the same size and shape. And so if you encounter such a polymer on Mars, that is one way you know that it is a biopolymer. This is coming from something that you would call living. So there's another thing that cannot change, and that is that you must be able to, when you evolve, have your informational polymer, your genetic system, able to change its information content without changing the physical behavior of the molecule, like its solubility, its reactivity, its molecular recognition rules. Now, one point that I have a hard time making, especially at a distance, is when I can't look at the audience and see whether they're catching on, is the point that such polymers are actually very rare. Proteins are not an example. And I've shown on this slide here an example from sickle cell anemia. If you make one amino acid replacement in the hemoglobin that is inside these red blood cells, the hemoglobin precipitates, right? And that forms this sickle cell, which is a, ca a characteristic of the disease. So the point is that, that you can't have your informational molecule precipitating when it changes its information to give you information that might make you more fit in a Darwinian sense. So Martian DNA may have four building blocks, six or eight or 10 or some other thing, but its backbone must have a repeating positive negative charge. It must be a polyelectrolyte because the repeating charge so dominates the physical properties of the DNA molecule, it makes it it's always soluble in water, no matter what the base pair sequence is. It makes it have the same molecular recognition rules, no matter what the base signature is. is. <laughs> okay, and so these are universals, and these are universals that are taught to us by synthetic polymer. So there you go, there's the summary slide. All life has informational polymers with size interchangeable building units and in water a repeating backbone charge. We know this because of theory, as I just discussed. We know this because of synthetic biology. In the lab, many things have been tried that violate those rules, they don't work. Um, but, and we, of course, can look for confirmation in Terran life, although this is hardly necessary anymore. We don't look to Terran life any longer to define or constrain our views of what molecular structures are essential for Darwinian evolution. 
So um, this is necessary for life. It's also if the RNA first model is correct, which I will not go into, sufficient for life. And furthermore, it's not sustainable for long without the presence of life. So now I would normally pause and ask for a show of hands, but not on a virtual con conference. Um, here's a quiz for the listeners. If you want to find life on Mars, what must you look for and where must you look for it? And just since this is an open book test, you must look for a polymer with a repeating backbone charge assembled from size interchangeable building units. And you will look for this in Martian water or Martian ice permafrost. How are we doing? Well, no hands are raised. So there you go. This two points, a backbone with a repeating charge and an informational units that are size and shape interchangeable form the basis of an agnostics life finder, which has the convenient acronym ALF. There is ALF on Mars. The repeating charge is very useful, as I mentioned already, since polyanions like our DNA or polycations can be concentrated from very dilute solution in electric fields. You can go to our blog here, which is at Primordial Scoop. Jan Spacek has a piece there. That's the reference. But if you just remember primordialscoop.org, it's a useful place to go see a lot of these issues discussed. If Martian water holds polycharged molecules assembled from units with all the same shape and size, we have had a Martian biology. And this is a Paul Davies life meter. So here is a design from Jan. Um, you're going to exploit electrical fields. There's a positive charged um, electrode on the left and, and red and a negative charged electrode on the right and black. Water, say, from in-situ research utilization mining is flowing in from the top. As it enters that blue hashed area, um, you are going to electrophoresis the molecules that are negatively charged to the left and the molecules that are positively charged to the right, depending on what Martian informational molecules have. This is what's called a free flow electrophoresis or countercurrent. You actually do not have any filters to clog. The molecule has to sort of electrophoresis up the flow, which is represented by those blue arrows where it will eventually be captured on a cartridge. And the key point about this alpha is it can stand astride a flow of conditioned water to concentrate polyelectrolytes from very dilute solution at little additional cost. And we notice that there's electrolysis going on here. The O2 is coming out the top on the left side and the H2 is coming out the top on the right side. And those are actually precursors for in-situ fuel generation. Those are actually resources that will be used. So you're not going to waste those, nor for that matter, will you waste the heat that's going to go into helping you do the water ice mining. So there you go. So SpaceX could find life on Mars. These are the conclusions of the talk by, right, alien DNA must have this repeating backbone charge. We know this because of synthetic biology work. Highly charged molecules are easy to isolate from water. Agnostic life finder finds these. And NASA, but the problem is that NASA will not ever build um, from ALF. Now, and we certainly tried to get them to do so. And I'm now going to do a crude advertisement. If anybody who builds instruments, I don't do much instrument building, um, wants to come give me a call, um, we would del be delighted to collaborate with you and to build an instrument that will do this. Um, the political part of this talk, and it gets me into trouble, I have to say at the outset, I love NASA. My father in law was an engineer for Apollo. There he is on the right, even with his shirt pocket protector. Um, and um, I actually encourage NASA to try to do this, uh, be, think outside the box and do something more than just writing white papers that achieve community consensus. And by the way, it's not just NASA, it's other space agencies. There's this wonderful quote from Farron about four years ago where he pointed out that life is, uh, um, uh, you know, the ESA mission was intended to search for life on Mars, that was its objectives but it was explicitly banding from going to special regions was where my Martian life might be. And I'm now quoting from their paper, as a consequence, this billion dollar life seeking mission will not be allowed to search for life everywhere on Mars, except in the very places, especially in the places where we might expect um, a life that exists. And this incongruous situation has been stagnant actually for a long time. And I won't go through the story. I just loved Carol's summary of this discussion with uh, Gil Levin and Patricia Strat. I mean, there was life detection. They were as positive signs. They were 
uh, countermanded by the mass spec, GC mass spec that Carol mentioned. I mean, my only contribution with this field was again now 22 years ago to point out that those mass spec data were misinterpreted. And it's been 22 years before now, finally in Carlsbad, as Carol mentioned in November 2019, NASA finally at last had a workshop to detect extant life on Mars. Now, NASA doesn't do chemistry very well. For example, I was listening to Penny Boston the other day talking about how do you detect life, and I'm just waiting for her to actually mention chemistry. Now, she's a very good biologist, of course, but not a single word about chemistry. So if you want to hear more about my complaints, I, there's my book on the lower right-hand corner, Life, the Universe, and the Scientific Method. So some su private enterprise must fly, ALF. Fortunately, ALF can be a low-cost add-on to SpaceX in suit to uh, fuel genera uh, to generation mission, because what it needs is water, a lot of it, right? Because the more water you have, the more chance you're gonna find Mars biology. Mars has lots of water um, and you've already heard about this. Um, on Earth, by the way, the permafrost on Mars would detect, would hold ALF detectable life. That's, but of course on Mars also, um, the SpaceX must mine a lot of water about 150 tons of methane are going to be made uh, each year for two years. And that mi mi mining must be running before humans arrive to manage the problem of forward contamination. And so if you put ALF between the water mine and the downstream processes, it would be a relatively low cost, low energy add-on to ISRU. Now, where to look, um, here's our two pictures from Jan, right? If you're worried about the special regions, the, of course, the dust storms will bring the special region dust to your landing site. Um, and of course, if you're worried about planetary contamination, the dust storm shall take your poop from the landing site to other special regions. So it's not making much sense, but perhaps we are hesitant to look for life on Mars because we think that life is not present on Mars. So this transforms actually into two questions. What's the probability of life emerging on Mars? And what's the probability of life persisting on Mars? Now, you know, we have a relatively good model for the life emerging on Earth. And this is a bit different from the dismal picture that Paul just presented. You know, I, I saw Paul two years ago where we actually talked about this paper on prebiotic chemistry that could not not have happened. Um, and so we have this model for life emerging on Earth about 4.36 billion years ago by an abiological synthesis of RNA from borate minerals, and I've mentioned that already, from carbon reservoirs that are stabilized by bisulfite addition products. That's relevant because bisulfite products are made from sulfur dioxide, which comes out of Vulcans, uh, volcanoes, and it's made by material that uh, contains carbon and nitrogen organics that are produced after impacts onto the surface of Earth. And um, that's a bit different from what Paul presented, but the important thing is it's almost the same. All of that happened as well on Mars. In fact, because of plate tectonics or the absence thereof on Mars, we have a much better record of the surface of Mars nearer to origins than we have on Earth. And in fact, the borate minerals are detected by Gazda in the paper that I cite here. And if you're interested in more of this, you can go back and look at the primordialscoop.org webpage. A lot of these issues are discussed. So we actually do think that Mars life is of an environment that is just as likely to have raised life originally, that is life was just as likely to have originated on Earth as on Mars. Now, the persistence of life is another question on Earth. Obviously, any place that water has water and energy available, Terran life has found a way to occupy it. We cannot be sure that on Mars life would have done the same thing as the planet cooled and dried and lost much of its atmosphere. But there is this Jeff Goldblum line from Jurassic Parks that life uh, uh, finds a way. So there is the conclusions. I'm now done my final slide. I don't put a slide left blank like Chris does, but again, the points that we want you to take home with you, if you and you can go to primordialscoop.org to see uh, user-friendly. Um, these are not scientific research papers, which are dense, but they're user-friendly presentations of these same points. The first, synthetic biology defines what alien life might DNA molecules might look like because we've tried a lot of other things and we've systematically uh, explored the universe of alternative structures. This includes invariance, repeating backbone charges and similarly structured informational building units that highly charged molecules are actually nice 
It's good that that's a part of the universal genetic structure because they're easy to isolate from water. They move in electric fields and they're captured on charred surfaces. The agnostic life finder that Jan has designed exploits these facts. Now, NASA may never build, at least not in my lifetime, an ALF, but SpaceX will be operating in my lifetime. It will be mining volumes of water to make fuel. And ALF can be an inexpensive add-on to the SpaceX ISRU mining process. Nice because it's looking at huge volumes of water, which in increases your chances of finding things. Um, and of course, the point is that since life on Earth and life on Mars seem to us based on chemical and mineralogical models have equal chances of originating, we expect that life did arise on Mars. And again, under the principle that life finds the way should have persisted there. And we're looking for instrument collaborators to as uh, make it so, as Jean-Luc Picard says. So with that, let me stop. I think we have a few minutes extra and I'll be happy to stop sharing my screen if I could figure out how to do that um, and um, um, ask her any questions you might have. Wonderful. Thank you so much for the presentation. Um, let's see. So the first question we have is, should engineered synthetic life incorporate additional nucleotide bases so as to enhance additional novel synthetic proteins with novel functional amino acids? Right. Well, that's a good question. And, and we've done that. Yes. So one of the things that we do know that additional letters that I've shown you are able to do is operate in translational systems to make proteins with additional amino acids. And so you have people all over Earth right now trying to figure out what additional amino acids they should add and what kinds of additional properties that they should use. So for, if you're Ferengi, you would be happy to know that there's a company, uh, Floyd Romersberg started called Synthorx, which earns much profit. They were sold, I think, for $2.4 billion because they were able to use an expanded genetic alphabet to add just one additional amino acid to a, uh, a protein biosynthesized using a ribosome. Thank you. Next question comes from Tony and they ask, in the variations of DNA that have more than four codes, what do the patterns code for? Is it the same proteins we're familiar with or something else? Well, they code for what the synthetic biologist makes them code for, right? So if I want to include those additional bases into a translation system to encode for things, um, I have to make a transfer RNA molecule that has the anti-codon built out of the expanded building blocks. I also have to make a messenger RNA that does that. But when we select for these things, that are binding to breast cancer cell or delivering drugs to cancer cells, for example, we're actually not doing a translation at all. We don't make any proteins because we have extra building blocks in the DNA and extra functional groups on those building blocks. Our expanded DNA looks a little bit like proteins. And so it can bind to things better than four letter DNA and can catalyze reactions better than four letter DNA. In fact, you can imagine an entire Martian life form that just uses expanded DNA without making proteins at all. And there is a theory, the RNA first theory, which I briefly mentioned, which says that life on earth actually emerged with RNA doing only, being the only encoded biopolymer that did both genetics and metabolism. Thank you very much, Stephen.